In the last lecture, we laid some groundwork for C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia. And as we closed, we heard how Aslan breathed life into the world of Narnia. This time, we pass once more the lamppost or the light of Narnia as we discuss Aslan and the White Witch. We will ask questions about their identity and consult both myth and scripture. When asked about the creation of the world of Narnia and the writing of the Chronicles, Lewis said, they all began with a picture of a fawn carrying an umbrella and parcels in a snowy wood. Clearly, Lewis's art and imagination were the jumping off points. The make-believe worlds of his childhood came to fruition and maturity in his writing about Narnia. It is a tale of fantasy and adventure that many have seen as a way to soft pedal Christianity, to get people to love Narnia and Aslan and wish for that in their lives before becoming aware of the Christian allegory and therefore to be open to the message of the Gospels. C.S. Lewis himself said that the elements of Christianity entered of their own accord. The lion, the witch, and the wardrobe has the ultimate moral battle, good versus evil. We'll start with the evil, the white witch, a character who has been in control of Narnia for some time, who has always, who's made it always winter and never Christmas. Let's hear what Mr. and Mrs. Beaver had to tell the children about the witch and her background. That's what I don't understand, Mr. Beaver, said Peter. I mean, isn't the witch herself human? She'd like us to believe it, said Mr. Beaver. And it's on that that she bases her claim to be queen but she's no daughter of Eve. She comes of your father Adam's, here Mr. Beaver bowed, your father Adam's first wife, her they called Lilith, and she was one of the jinn. That's what she comes from on one side, and on the other she comes of the giants. No, no, there isn't a drop of real human blood in the witch. That's why she's bad all through, Mr. Beaver, said Mrs. Beaver. True enough, Mrs. Beaver, replied he. There may be two views about humans, meaning no offense to the present company, but there's no two views about things that look like humans and aren't. The beavers tell the children that the witch does not have a drop of real human blood in her. Rather, she is a descendant of Adam's first wife, Lilith. They tell the children that she was one of the jinn. But who was Lilith, and what or who were the jinn? The stories or myths about Lilith are fascinating from many viewpoints. It may be a story that is unfamiliar. It takes us deep into Hebrew myth, Canaanite women, and the ancient world, and will lead us to a discussion of the Genesis stories and the Gnostics. The beavers have mentioned the name Lilith. What did it mean? Lilith is usually derived from the Babylonian Assyrian word, Yilatu, a female demon or wind spirit, one of a triad mentioned in Babylonian spells. But she appears on a 2000 BC Sumerian tablet from Ur. So what was the myth? Why don't we hear much about Adam's first wife? According to the book Hebrew Myths by Robert Graves, Adam wanted a mate. He had seen all the animals as pairs and had tried unsuccessfully to mate with them. Lilith was God's answer to Adam's prayers. God then formed Lilith, the first woman, just as he had formed Adam, except that he used filth and sediment instead of pure dust. Adam and Lilith never found peace together. For when Adam wished to lie with her, Lilith took offense at the recumbent position he demanded. Why must I lie beneath you, she asked. I also was made from dust and am therefore your equal. Because Adam tried to compel her obedience by force, Lilith in a rage uttered the magic name of God, rose into the air and left him. 
Some say Lilith ruled as a queen in Zamagad and again in Sheba, and was the demoness who destroyed Job's, Job's sons. Yet she escaped the curse of death which overtook Adam since they parted before the fall. As the story or myth of Lilith continues, we hear more of her terrible deeds and learn of her offspring, the Lilim. It is probably these lesser demon children of Lilith that the beavers are referring to when they talk of the jinn. Room for Lilith can be found in scripture. If we take, at the two, take a look at the two creation accounts from Genesis side by side, we see clear divergences between the accounts. Thus Lilith has been presumed as Adam's first wife from a careless weaving of an early Judean and a late priestly tradition. The older version contains the rib incident. Lilith typifies the Anath worshipping Canaanite women who were permitted prenuptial promiscuity. Time after time, the prophets denounced Israelite women for following Canaanite practices. At first, apparently with the priest's approval, since their habit of dedicating to God the fees thus earned is expressly forbidden in Deuteronomy. Lilith and Genesis lead us into a discussion of the Gnostics. Lilith appears in Gnostic writing. Much of the Gnostic writings were discovered in the Nag Hammadi Valley in Upper Egypt in 1945. William Blake, a 19th century Gnostic and poet, wrote of the differences between his view and the mainstream view of scripture. Both read the Bible day and night, but you read black where I read white. This was the case for the Gnostic Christians and their opponents in the third and fourth centuries. The orthodox view was that Genesis was history with a moral. Adam and Eve were considered to be historical figures, the literal ancestors of our species. One important consequence of their transgression was the lowly and morally ambivalent status of women. But the Gnostic Christians did not see, same, see things the same way. The Gnostics saw Genesis as a myth with a meaning. To them, Adam and Eve and Lilith were not actual historical figures, but representatives of two principles within every human being. Adam was the dramatic embodiment of the psyche or soul. Eve stood for spirit. For the Gnostics, the soul was the embodiment of the emotional and thinking functions of the personality. The spirit represented human capacity for spiritual consciousness. The soul was the lesser self or ego, the spirit, the higher self. Therefore, Eve is by nature superior to Adam rather than his inferior as applied by orthodox, implied by orthodoxy. This difference in view alone makes it abundantly clear why the Gnostic writings were hidden away for generations. We have wandered far from Narnia in this discussion of the witch's identity and her antecedents, but I would like to leave you with a wonderful description of Gnosticism by Harold Bloom, an American scholar. If you can accept a God who coexists with death camps, schizophrenia and AIDS, yet remains all powerful and somehow benign, then you have faith and you have accepted the covenant with Yahweh. If you know yourself as having an affinity with the alien or stranger God cut off from this world, then you are a Gnostic and perhaps the best and strongest moments still to come to what is best and oldest in you, to a breath or spark that long precedes this creation. So we leave the philosophy and theology of the Gnostics and return once more to Narnia, where the ultimate battle is good versus evil and Christian allegory reigns. Many commentators have focused solely on the White Witch as Satan and Aslan as Jesus. As we have seen from an exploration of the Lilith myths, myth, perhaps C.S. Lewis saw her as more. I would argue strongly that Aslan's role is far more as well. Aslan appears to the children as a lion, but does take other forms in other books in the Chronicles. Our parallels to Jesus are easy to trace. The most obvious, of course, is the scene of Aslan's sacrifice and resurrection. We see and hear of the deep magic 
and the deeper magic of the claiming of a traitor's blood and sacrifice freely given. The parallels to the Easter story do not stop with the sacrifice. We have the cutting of Aslan's mane, the humiliation, the jeering, the sense of power over a seemingly powerless being. We have Susan and Lucy's vigil, and of course we have the resurrection. But it is the new Aslan, the resurrected, more powerful Aslan that captures our attention. He is a healer, just like Christ. He heals on the battlefield and he restores life as the Gospels tell us Jesus did with Lazarus. But it is in the restoring of life to the statues that we see the divinity and the Trinitarian nature of Aslan. We know from the magician's nephew that Aslan created the world of Narnia, that he breathed life into the world. With the statues, he does it again. Is it the creator God? the healing God or the spirit of guidance. The wind of Pentecost and the hymn, Breathe on me breath of God, spring to mind. So what do we know about Aslan? We are told that he is the son of the emperor over the sea. And we saw that Aslan created Narnia in the magician's nephew. If you've read some of the other books in the series, you know that Aslan appears to Lucy and her cousin Eustace in the form of a lamb in the voyage of the Dawn Treader. Where did the name come from? Aslan means lion in Turkish. The name alone in the books thrills the good and fills the bad with horror. So why did Lewis choose a lion for his character of pure goodness? Lewis believed in what used to be called muscular Christianity. In this sense, Christ is represented as athletic, masculine, and militant. This is not the meek, mild lamb who triumphs through moral strength. This character has teeth and he can roar. An excellent hero to appeal to children. The children in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe are told that although Aslan is good, he is definitely not safe and that he is not a tame lion. In Narnia, almost everything that happens is because of the power and wisdom and intervention of Aslan. I see Aslan as far more than just a stand-in for Jesus Christ. I see him as a Trinitarian figure, creator, redeemer, sanctifier. We'll look more deeply at notions of redemption and forgiveness next time when we focus on the children. As we close, let us consider Aslan's transformative nature. To come face to face with Aslan is to realize that you aren't who you thought you were. We are told that Aslan is the son of the emperor beyond the sea, and that he is king and that he is good. He's also fearsome and terrible. But perhaps C.S. Lewis's most fascinating description of Aslan comes after his resurrection, when Aslan romps. Does this reveal Lewis's attitude toward the nature of God? Or is it a comment about Christianity and pleasure? Oh, children, said the lion, I feel my strength coming back to me. Oh, children, catch me if you can. He stood for a second, his eyes very bright, his limbs quivering, lashing himself with his tail. Then he made a leap high over their heads and landed on the other side of the table. Laughing, though she didn't know why, Lucy scrambled over it to reach him. Aslan leaped again. A mad chase began. Round and around the hilltop he led them, now hopelessly out of their reach, now letting them almost catch his tail, now diving between them, now tossing them in the air with his huge and beautifully velveted paws and catching them again, and now stopping unexpectedly so that all three of them rolled over together in a happy, laughing heap of fur and arms and legs. It was such a romp as no one has ever had except in Narnia. And whether it was more like playing with a thunderstorm or playing with a kitten, Lucy could never make up her mind. 
And the funny thing was that when all three finally lay together panting in the sun, the girls no longer felt in the least tired or hungry or thirsty. Thank you.